What's up, everybody? I want to welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Melanated Convo podcast. This is your guy, Harrison, man, bringing you a brand new episode. I'm definitely excited to be back. Like I always say, going forward, we just going to have a fire guest on the show. So if you if this is your first time tuning into the Melanated Convo podcast, we do a few things here. As you can hence the name Melanin, I'm just using that as a familiar term for the name Black. It's a cool way to say Black. We have conversations about what goes on in our community, but this information is for everybody. And I tell people this all the time. I mean, I'm not changing the name of my platform. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not ostracizing any group of people. But when you go to Chinatown, when you go to the part of your town where they're all Mexican stores, right? Smells good. Ambiance looks cool, right? The name of the restaurant is in Spanish, right? This is kind of a way of telling you, you know, this ain't for you, but can you go in there and buy something? Yeah, they're going to serve you. They're going to be nice to you. But when you look around, all of it looks like I'm, I'm comfortable here, but this is for a different culture, right? Same thing with my show. <laughs> Same thing with my platform, family. This is for, we talk about issues that are strictly pertaining to black people at times but for the most part these are human experiences right these are human experiences but i would be lying if i said i'm from a community that doesn't do well with a lot of stuff right and you can say it's because of racism you can say it's because we need to pick ourselves up by the bootstrap the bottom line is is this happening and I take it upon myself to try to address some of the ills of our community. If you want different types of in, uh, entertainment, if you want a, a show about the latest entertainers or about rappers or about Instagram models, or you can find all that stuff. Everything is somewhat of an acquired taste. You know what I mean? So quit asking me to change the name of my show. <laughs> I'm not doing it. This, this, this platform is for my people. My whole inspiration behind starting this platform is based on me being a father at a young age and me participating in some of the ills of our society and looking back and saying, well, you know what? I did that wrong. Now, at the time, I didn't know much about history. So now I know that there were other things in play. But at the same time, my level of accountability wasn't where it is or wasn't where it needed to be. So it is my life's purpose to create a platform where we can talk about the different things fathers need to do, what mothers need to do, the 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 ills of the community we come from, all while attempting to build generational wealth, right? By attempting to be more familiar with the business world and just interact with different parts of society that a lot of us aren't familiar with. And a lot of times I speak from like the hood inner city environment family because that's where I'm from. Like we have, there's a whole bunch of information on YouTube and different places where you can find things. The Everything has to come from honesty. Everything has to come from your experience. So I say all that to say thank you very much for tuning into another episode of the Melanated Combo Podcast. I just had to get that off my chest because I get the questions, and I'm just so happy at this point that I have people interacting with me. Of course, I would like my platform to be much bigger, but we're getting there. You feel me? So thank you, everybody, for tuning into another episode of the show. If you're listening to this on one of the digital platforms, Overcast, Spotify, um, 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 Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, please leave a review if you like what we're talking about. Share the show with your friends. Share the show with your friends if you're listening or watching from one of the um, um, video platforms or my Facebook page, which is Harrison Anderson on Facebook, or Melanated Fathers TV on Facebook. If you're watching it on the YouTube channel, which is Melanated Fathers TV on YouTube, like the video, subscribe the video, or subscribe to the Melanated Fathers TV YouTube channel, which has history videos, it has news stories, it has this show that's been fire the past couple of weeks, if I might say so myself, you know what I mean? So get on board. And I got a special guest who I've spoken to before, but me and the brother have never had a video one-on-one -on -one type of conversation. And now he has a book, so I'm excited. But let's get into it. The first thing we do here on the Melanated Convo podcast, let me share my screen really quick, family, is we talk about black businesses. Why do we talk about black businesses? Because there's not enough of them. Another reason we talk about black businesses, there was there were a time in our society where we had things like uh, Black Wall Street and all black enclaves, which we used as vehicles to fund our society, to fund our community. Now, we live in we we are 13, 14 percent of the population. So let's be honest, we are going to shop with people who don't look like us. There's nothing wrong with going to Walmart, going to you have to survive. You have to be practical. You have to use all these use your discernment when deciding wh where you're going to shop. But 
I, I implore everyone, if you love your people, if you have a vested interest in your people doing well, and if you don't like racism, if you don't like the political landscape, if you don't like institutionalized racism, if you don't like any of the ills that we have to deal with in this society, one of the revolutionary acts that you can participate in is supporting a black business. You know what I mean? And, I, and like I always say, I may present, excuse me, family, I may present a business that you don't like or that it isn't something that you would rock with. Cool. Go out and find one. Go out and find one, then use your social media in a um in the correct way and share it. Let everybody know. Give the black business some leeway. You get it on the wrong day, uh, you hint a little unprofessionalism. Try to reach out to them, try to talk to them. All too often, we want the hookup and we want to approach, we look at black businesses the same way people outside of our community do. Now, granted, I don't want to tell you to spend your money with somebody who doesn't value your money, i.e. being unprofessional, i.e. not quality products. To me, the tiebreaker is the fact that you're black, meaning I can get whatever I need from somewhere else and they're providing me something that I like and, and I like the quality. You're providing me something that I like and I like the quality. The tiebreaker is that you look like me. We spend too, we work too hard. Most of us work too hard for our funds just, just to give it to someone um, who don't respect business or haven't put the work in business wise you know what i mean so i say all that to say I'm, I'm feeling good today family i got my boy on the show we're gonna talk about relationships i have dante doss on the show by the way and we're gonna talk about relationships he has a new book coming out called we need to talk right it's we need to talk Oh, we need to talk. That's right. We need to talk. Yep. Right. New blood coming out. We need to talk. And I'm just curious to know what we need to talk about. You feel me? So let's get yeah. into it, man. The first black business is my boy Sylvester, another brother that I interviewed. Um, the 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 inception of my platform was all online, and I would interview fathers about um our strife in society, interview fathers because there was a stereotype about how how unaffected we are in our kids' life and about also about how uninvolved we are in our kids lives and i knew that wasn't the truth so i went on a mission found a lot of brothers who when i interviewed them everybody gave me exactly what i needed as far as they humanized the father experience and everybody was trying their best to be there now shortcomings happen but everybody was trying their best to be there so that was the inception of my platform sylvester like dante is a brother that i met when that was the case sylvester was just a struggling father trying to figure it out had a couple of baby mama issues you know what i mean that he's he's ultimately figured out and the brother has started a platform based on his experiences based on his understanding of what needs to happen differently in our society instead of just sitting on your hands sometimes it's best to go out and try your best to do do better and help out society right so he started black father nation which isn't only just an organization in the minnesota area that helps black fathers with resources, um, problems with your with with your uh, uh, son or daughter's mother, problems with finances, problems with transportation. Sylvester has a lot of resources in that area that can help you out. He also has clothing, the Black Father Nation clothing. Give me one moment here. I'll pull some of that up. And again, this brother's platform is inspiring to me because when I started, you know, he didn't have this. And, and 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 I've watched him create the building blocks for what is now, you know, a successful business for him. And I'm just proud of the brother. So blackfathernation.com is the website. You click on shop, you'll see that he has shirts, beanies, hats. And as you can see, something interesting that he does, right? That I think everybody, it, it kind of speaks to what I just said, uh, what I just said a few moments ago. He sells his shirts to every walk of life. And there's white, he'll have a on his Instagram, he'll have a white man wearing a Black Father Nation shirt. He'll have a Mexican man. The Saying that I'm proud of my heritage and proud of who I am isn't saying that you dislike anybody else. So the sooner um, people outside of the Black community can understand that, the better. You know what I mean? So go to BlackFatherNation.com. You can look at some of the interviews he's had, which was one of mine. You can look at the events that he's thrown. He does a lot of things there in the Minnesota area, like I said, from from cleaning up parks to showing black fathers how to braid their daughter hair. So it's a lot of different things that he offers. He also has the clothing line that helps support everything else. So get yourself a pin. He has stickers. 
He has these these cool sweaters. He has a beanie. I think I'm gonna get one of these beanies for the winter time. He gracefully sent me some of these items. So that's my brother, man. Go to blackfathernation.com. Get you some gear. Tap in with the brother if you're in the Minnesota area, even if you are not in the Minnesota area and you need some of these resources. Tap in with my boy. He'll be able to help you out. You feel me? Now, next black business, last black business. This is in the spirit of my brother Dante being on the show. This next black business is by, hold on a moment here. Hold on, that's the wrong button. A brother that I, that have, that has a radio show, a brother named Zoe Williams that has a radio show. Um, I've been following Zoe for several years now. He's um, in, in, extremely insightful when it comes to relationships, when it comes to politics, different things like that. But what I want to uh, alert the family to is he wrote a new book called The Holographic Relationship. Now, again, this is important to me because this is an in gentleman. This is a gentleman when I began to think different. And, you know, I would call myself conscious, but that's kind of a cliche now. Just aware of myself, aware of society, aware of the world around me. This is one of the brothers who began to give me seeds of knowledge without even knowing it. Like he did this from uh, from afar. Right. But he's released a few books. The latest book. The holographic relationship, I think, is important. I, like I said, I'm speaking about it because the brother Dante is on the show. But also, you know, how we relate to each other is extremely important. Now, so today on the show in Zoe's book is, is primarily about intimate relationships, but it's just what relationships in general. Most of us have, like, horrible relating skills, just to be honest. If not horrible, damn near. You know what I mean? If you haven't taken the time to get an understanding of who you are, taking the time to get an understanding of your triggers, taking the, just just figuring out who you are and where your place is in life, how you were raised, who raised you, what they taught you. If you haven't critically examined all these things, you could be causing somebody some problems right now. You know what I mean? You could you, motherfuckers can hate to see you coming, so to speak. And you don't want that. You know what I mean? Especially if you're black and you had to deal with poverty. I mean, you, you add up all these things, it can make for um, an unevolved human. <laughs> Shit. So anything you can read about relationships, anything you can watch about relationships, I think you're never too old to learn. So if you go to I am Zoe Williams, that's the brother's name, Zoe Williams, you go to I am Zoe Williams. He has a new book, Holographic Relationships, which d gets into detail about intimate relationships and relating holographically just means to see within somebody, see within yourself, like look a little bit deeper before you make judgment or even before you get into an intimate relationship. There's a lot of soul searching and revelations that need to take place. A lot of us just don't take the time to do this. I've been that way. I struggle with it today, but you have to know um, you have to have a tool belt that equips you when things like this happen. Right. So. I am Zoe Williams .com. I am Zoe Williams .com. If you go to Zoe What, if you look up Zoe What, another plug here. If you look up Zoe What on YouTube, you'll see his show where he talks a lot about relationships and relating and, and, and politics and some things are funny. So great, 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 great. Go to I am Zoe Williams .com to check out my brother's new book, The Holographic Relationship. Now, now let's get into it, man. I'm ready. So like I said before, I had this brother on the show or Actually, this was all written and I would release written interviews. That was, again, the exception of how I started. And I met this brother. I, I went on a search for brothers who wanted to talk about because that's another thing. Like, I know people who go through a lot of things with their woman and with the woman they're with at the time <laughs> or life. Right. Everybody don't want to talk about that shit. So when I get a black man who's willing, who's articulate, that 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 always helps. I mean, let's just be honest. Who can who can articulate what they've been through? I quickly begin to learn. Okay, I have to do this audio form because sometimes women in relationships they talk more than us. They they say a, a shitload of more words than we do on a day to day basis. But we talk too. Just sometimes we get around men and we talk about sports. We talk about big asses, and I like sports and big asses. <laughs> but we got to talk about what's really going on and our feelings like we have feelings too we don't want to say it. we have feelings too so in order to evolve in relationships and get better you got to talk about these things and the brother is releasing a new book and i said you know what my platform is the perfect place for him to come on and talk about the new book how you doing today dante 
Man, I'm doing well. I'm busy, busy as hell, but I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing great, brother. I'm, you cool. know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to build my platform and yes, take things to the next, to the next level. And Absolutely. I'm, just, I'm just having a blast while doing it. Hey, you know what I mean? With, it. I'm with <laughs> it. Do it. Do it. Keep doing it. Love it. Definitely. Definitely. So real quick, I want to tell everybody, I wasn't going to ask this, but I do want to preference this. Tell everybody where you're from, Dante. Uh, born in Cleveland, raised mm. in Nashville. Um, I went to college in Atlanta, mm. lived there for quite a while, about 15 years. Um, and back in Nashville now, I've been back to Nashville for about 10 years, 11 years now. So okay. residing currently in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And yes, if my memory serves me correctly, you have two kids, right? I have two children, two teens now. So, and you know, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, even though we we somewhat familiar with each other, I, yeah. I, I asked for pictures and everything when I did your last interview. Then I yeah. seen the kids. I'm like, these kids grow up so fast, man. man too fast. I mean, he she just turned 16 last mm. month and uh, he'll be 15. And uh, so, yeah, he's almost as tall as I Well, Actually, we're the same height. And um, he actually just asked for some of my shoes. Now we're about 11 and a uh, half. This boy was <laughs> 11 and a half. He's 15. So... Um, so I was like, yeah, you can wear my, some J's I got. And I was like, yeah, you can have them. So, mm. uh, yeah, that just growing fast, man. It's amazing. I'm getting ready to start teaching her how to drive and all that. So it's, Ooh. it's been a blessing, man. It's, I mean, from the first time we talked, yeah, mm -hmm. they were real little. So time mm -hmm. has really, really, really gone by real quickly. Yep. Yep. And, and we're going to, we're going to get into the book here, but tell me, bro, like how has that experience been? Because like we're saying, they grow up extremely fast. Um, getting into teenage years when I learned, you know, I'm, when my kids were younger, I'm more of a dictator, right? So I'm do this, do that. You better mm -hmm. do, do do this. Mm -hmm. Once they become teenagers, it gets to a point where you got to, your role has to switch a little bit. Like how, how has that been for you? It's been okay. Uh, you know, my, it's funny. I'm, of course, it's a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. They're so different. Um, she looks like her mother. He looks like me, but her personality is like mine. His personality is like his mother. So she's real cool, real laid back, um, handles her business. I don't have to say too much to her, but you know, boys, whole totally different thing. I, you know, I kind of understand what my mother, I do understand now what my mother dealt with, with me and my brother, I was the oldest, but being a single mother that she was that reared us, I understand it now, how boys can be and how rough they can be. He just started high school uh, this year, but all four years of middle school were rough. You know, yeah. you know he didn't want to do his work. Of course, boy's a genius literal genius um he's been astute and you know whatever in the mind since he was two three years old very great drawer drawer uh, artist so i uh, got him in a, in a school here it's called national school of arts hmm. so trying to cultivate that along with uh, his computer skills he loves computers and internet gaming and all that with guys so with his uh, friends so it's real cool but you know just it, four years of middle school rough so I, i'm like you that dictatorship or because i'm like hey because that's the thing you know we we have learned we're older. We're on the other side now. So it's like, okay, this, you know, life is can be rough, but you've got to do, you know, I keep telling them, I've always, always pressed upon them. You've got to do whatever you've got to do to be successful. And I'm like, that's my job is to make sure that you're successful in life. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we already as black men, as black people already have so many odds against us. Yes. So I'm like, you know, I'm trying to get, you know, rear you all correctly to make sure that you're successful. And I'm like, I've given you all the tools giving you whatever. So I'm like, you've got it. You know, it's your choice to do that. So I get the autonomy now, but you know, boys, boys will be boys. So you know, hard hit it, hard hit it. Well, and, you, and you just said something that impressed me a little bit. And I, and I think parents can kind of learn from that. Did you say you put him into a different school based on um, some abilities he had or based on that's, that's perfect right there. Because yeah. I think me, that made me think back to me being a young father and being 19, 20, 21 years old and um, wasn't mature and was moving too fast in life. Mm -hmm. So when I would see maybe one of my kids had a spark or something, I wasn't mature enough. I wasn't financially stable enough right. to harness whatever that is and move it forward. So talk to me just real quick. Talk yeah. to me about how important that was, like seeing something your kid is good at and saying, OK, I'm going to make the ultimate. I'm going to show you I got your back the ultimate way. Mm -hmm. by changing the environment because that could be difficult for a kid change the environment absolutely. change the school you know what i mean absolutely well you know that's the thing man with with him like i said he's literally a genius to me i mean he he has his he has the acumen i think i would say of me and his, and my ex-wife of his mother 
you know, we, we're, we're just intelligent people, just intellectual, whatever. So really uh, just creative and, and really uh, just we, we're good at what we do. And uh, so with him, that was the biggest thing. Her and I, we're not artists at all. Um, he's got really neat handwriting, which is funny because I do, my father does, and his father did. Mm. So his handwriting is really neat. But then I, I started realizing, okay, well, he's good at drawing when he was one, uh, two years old, three years old. But then I'm like, or excuse me, writing. But then when he started drawing, I'm like, oh, okay. So he started saying, hey, look at this, daddy, look at this. I'm like, okay, that's good. It's real good. And it just, it just progressed. And I mean, to the point where he's like, could you buy me, uh, you know, buy me a, a, these sketch pads? Could you buy me these sets of tools to draw, whatever, you know, pencils and things? I'm like, yeah. So I, as I kept doing that, I mean, he just got better and better to the point he's drawing a picture of me in the car, his sister sitting in the car, like as we're going on a road trip or something, you know, just, mm -hmm. I mean, his talent is so amazing. And uh, and so one of the things that I realized, that's okay, he's a boy, he doesn't want to do schoolwork, but he's really intelligent, but this is what he's good at. So I'm like, how could, like you said, how could I harness that and, and really enhance that? And the School of Arts, I was sitting, ironically, I was sitting at a, a graduation for a goddaughter of mine a couple of years ago. Now she's a singer, really singer. Her name's Beyonce, of course. <laughs> so she's singing and during the, this graduation is just totally different than anything that you, you or I have probably ever seen. You know, they're, they, uh, you know, they're cultivating art and talent. So theater arts, music arts, uh, visual arts, all of those things that fall within the arts category, they, they enhance and they uh, cultivate. So this graduation is a performance. That's exactly what it is. I mean, they're singing, they're doing numbers the whole time. I mean, even the, uh, the principal came out like Elton John with his sparkly jacket on and sang a number. <laughs> so it was really cool. And you know, as I'm sitting there, I'm like, this would be perfect for him because I'm like, okay, he doesn't really want to do work, but he loves to draw. So that for me was just a, a light bulb moment to say, okay, this is where he, he, he's going. And it's a magnet school, so we had to do the lottery and all of that. But mm -hmm. I mean, we put together a very dope pro portfolio. Um, basically we did the, uh, well, we did it last year. So of course with COVID and the pandemic, they weren't able to go to school physically to do the uh, auditions that they do. So we did it online, did it digitally. digitally and um, it was really, it really turned out well. Like, it was probably one of the best ones that they've seen. So. Um, that's one thing I've already always impressed upon them. Hey, when our last name's on something and he's named after me, the second. So mm -hmm. I'm like, when my name's on it too, you know, I want it polished. I want it clean. So that's what we did and got him in there. I mean, it took them no time to make a determination for him to be in there. So that for me was the thing. I was like, how can I harness those things and, and, and enhance them? Because for me, you know, there's things that I want to do. I wanted to be a Formula One racer. Now I race my motorcycle and my cars and stuff, but I wanted to be a Formula One racer and I didn't get to do that dream. But for them, I'm like, whatever you want to do in life, I want you to do that and be the best that you can be at it. So for me, that's one thing that I've always impressed upon myself, even to make sure that I'm, you know, uh, enhancing and cultivating those mm -hmm. things that they're good at. Yep, that's a Remember great a thing, too, my, my brother. My voice is getting, I'm starting to lose my voice. It's crazy. No, no, it's all good, brother. It's all good. And <laughs> that's a good thing, my brother, because time is fleeing. And to capture those things when they're actually happening in the moment, I yes, salute sir. you for that. And yes, that could sir. be and that could be the difference in his life. Like that small. Well, that's kind of a big adjustment, too. But that adjustment can be what was necessary to oh, get absolutely. him to where he's actually going to be. And absolutely. kids, when kids become adults, yeah. they realize this and they say, wait, whoa, that was that was big. My pops yeah. do that. You know what I mean? So yeah. I salute you for that, brother. Now, yeah, absolutely. let's get into this book. We yes, need sir. to talk, right? So, so tell me, Dante, what inspired you to write this book, brother? This book has been a long time coming. Uh, when I first took my notes last year and started on it, this book, honestly, um, I got notes from 2013 that I found in my email. Mm -hmm. So it's been going for the longest. I, I got divorced in 2009, and uh, but I went through a very tumultuous marriage, and you know we, you know, we discussed that in the interview last time, and. That's that's my thing. And, you know, I like you, that's what I've been using to try to help others, uh, mm. it, not even just really men, because I've been through some things, that, you know, as a, as a single father and, uh, you know, with the family court system and such trying to fight to get custody. But at the time, but, uh, you know, that's one of the things about it. The, the, the book itself, uh, you know, my, my I was going through so much stuff, to be honest, in my marriage. It just is surreal. When I think about it now, I'm like, was I really going through that stuff? Because it's just so crazy. And my neighbors at the time when I lived in Atlanta, they said, man, you need to write, you need to either write a book 
or be on a Lifetime movie. They were like, because this stuff is just crazy. <laughs> So, you know, of course, didn't do the Lifetime movie. Who knows? It might turn into a movie later on. You never know. You never know. You never know. But, you know, with my story, uh, you know, this is a thing. And I and I tell people, I, you know, I ended up uh, fighting for custody. It was a really uh, tumultuous battle uh, following the tumultuous marriage, right? So ended up, uh, ended up in jail. I ended up in jail for three weeks based on a lie uh, that my ex-wife told uh, hmm. about custody of the kids. She, I had the kids and she told a lie in another state, said I had I was abducted. I mean, that I abducted them. And uh, I ended up basically getting a speeding ticket in, in Tennessee. Hadn't been to Maryland in, what, 15 years, 20 years. Got a ticket. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, got pulled over speeding. And they said, you're a fugitive. Mm. I'm like, what? So they said I was a fugitive from Maryland. When they said that, I said, she's done something. So I ended up in jail for three weeks until my lawyers fixed it and got me out. Um, mm. Because I, at that point, you know, I'm like, there was nothing I could do. So I, as I was sitting in there, I had talked to guys, talked to this one guy who um, was in there and probably was going to have served life. Uh, I haven't talked to him in a while, but uh, tried to keep in contact with him. He uh, had gotten drunk one night, real nice guy, got drunk at a bar, ended up uh, killing uh, somebody who was a famous country music star here. Um, and this guy, you know, he was, you know, doing well, had a family or has a family, making over six figures, all that in his career. And, you know, I started learning things as I'm listening to this guy. And so I'm sitting there that, that night after he had told me a story, I'm sitting there, I'm like, God, I've done everything not to end up in here. I'm completely innocent, yet I'm in here. Hmm. And God immediately told me and said, you always said, you know, when you teach classes, teach people, whatever, even when, when I was practicing preaching, he was like, you always said, you never want to hear from anybody who's never been through anything. Hmm. And that, that was just, that was another light bulb moment for me. So uh, you know, with that and everything that I went through, I said it was such a crazy but unique experience. I was mm -hmm. like, and I'm talking to guys who are going through this, maybe not on the scale or even near the scale I was, but they're going through it. And I said, you know what? I need to start helping some brothers mm -hmm. because the family court system, I saw how it was. I saw how innocent I was, yet they just believe whatever and, mm -hmm. and set me up. So that was, that was the main thing is, okay, how can I start doing things? And then on top of that, um, at this point, um, you know, unfortunately, even this week, I have two friends that uh, that died this week. Um, and unfortunately, supposedly, both of them died by suicide. Mm. So those I say that to say uh, the person I learned about today, that's the 60th person in two and a half years I've known has died. I've watched two of my uh, best friends die. Uh, I was you know, next to them on their deathbeds, one of an overdose, one um, dying of uh, cancer, eating them up and uh, just people one after the other. Damn. My uncle, uh, my uh, favorite uncle died uh, in April and uh, ironically he died. I'm not a numerologist. I don't I don't really study any of that, but he died on April 10th, uh, which was my wedding day. Um, mm -hmm. And I had just called him right before he died. And I had told him about the weekend of my wedding back in, in 2004 when I got married on April 10th. And I said, hey, you know, um, it, it just had it really was just a joke about something my mother had joked about with me and him. And I had said, you remember this on my wedding weekend? And then a couple of days later on my wedding day or what would have been my anniversary, he died. And so it really just, all of that just put a catalyst to say, I, I need to, there's, there's something here. Um, and with him and how I admired him, how he was a great father, he was a great uh, uh, husband to my aunt. And, and I, he's the person really that all my life I've emulated. I grew a mm -hmm. beard because of him and wanted to be like him. He really, uh, you know, he looked like Fred Sanford, looked like Red Fox, well, really Fred Sanford with the beard. Yeah. And uh, there's a picture called the banjo lesson where uh, an old man who looks like Fred Sanford in the, in the background teaching this little boy how to uh, how to uh, play the banjo. And he had that picture on his wall. So all of that stuff, I was like, is something that I've got to do to leave a legacy. The same way that he's left a legacy, the same way that my friends are getting out here, like you said, people leaving out here left and right. What can I do? And then with my children, I'm like, what can I do to leave a legacy? Because all of these people are leaving. But I want to I don't want it to be I just passed through here. I want to do something to help. Globally, you know, there Adolf you Hitler and all these other people, they're known for the most horrible, horrific things. Yes. I'm like, I want to be the opposite. I want to be somebody who, who leaves a, a legacy that's positive. Mm -hmm. And so this book has just been honestly a culmination of my experience. It's really written from an experiential standpoint, a personal experiential standpoint of everything I went through in marriage. So, you know, I, 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 I named it We Need to Talk because that was one of the things that in my marriage I didn't do. We didn't mm -hmm. do um, and that's one of the things that I think so many people need to do is have those hard conversations 
when it comes to marriage and even relationships, you know, as Zoe is putting out there. Got it. Got it. OK, so I have a few questions. Well, first, yeah. let me commend you on I will call it like listen to everything you just now said. It's powerful. I will call it just paying attention to the universe. Like if you pay attention, you'll see things happening. And I think death is one of the um the the things that happen in life where we we should look at those pieces of time as time is fleeing like nobody has a lot of time you don't know how much time people have and you mentioned adolf hitler and and, and individuals like this now i mean just re reading about adolf hitler he did a few good things he he had a the right state of mind to do certain things certain things he was just way off on but he took right. the initiative he took the initiative and did some things i mean that's that part we all can take from like you have to start there's so many things people want to do with their lives getting caught in the rat race which is working there's nothing wrong with having a job we all need money but i always tell people you got to create something for yourself something on your own something that you can do that you love to do now some people are working jobs that they would do for free that's a beautiful combination that many of us don't get to experience you know what i mean most yeah. of us are doing what we were taught to do doing what we have skills in to get money but you have to find that thing that's yours and in my opinion that has to come from personal experience it's like you can't go through a particular set of things and just say okay i want to go talk about race cars or talk well what do you know about it what give me the experience like you said the it being doing this based on experience well we all know that's the best teacher but what do you do with the situations you go through right mm -hmm. i think that's one of the keys of life some people harp on them and blame other people some right. people make excuses why said thing didn't go right mm -hmm. the better of us take full accountability of the action and then start working our way down maybe somewhere down there is somebody else's fault too but nobody made you do nothing you know what i mean so this i'm um, i figured that was part of your inspiration and i think that's just a great thing bro now i want you to tell me because we're gonna talk relationships today we're gonna talk about yeah. it you oh, write yeah. it uh, yeah, shit. you writing a book about it so we're gonna get into it that's what it. are some of the main and again this is all from your perspective so audience people listening understand that we're two men we're gonna give our perspective on things that we think go. we ain't got all the answers but we we've been through some shit so so yeah. what do you think are some of the main issues that prevent us black people all people that prevent us from having healthy intimate relationships man you know that's that's a big question that's the thing in the in the preface of the book i always say or i've said I don't have the definitive answers for anything. Of course, of it's course. It's experiential, like you said. And of every course. every per body's perspectives are different. Of course. But I think, you know, from what I've seen, um, you know, it's funny. I, I had a Twitter page years ago. Um, they actually closed my page. They trumped me. They closed my page like him. Like, I wasn't even on there, but I think I pissed off enough people in the 10 years I was on there uh, <laughs> telling the truth. And, you know, yeah. people hate the truth. But I think that's that's one of the things I would watch the debates, the gender wars that would go on about relationships and $200 dates and all this, what do you bring to the table is the, the current thing. And I think that's the thing is a lot of people for one thing um, aren't real. They, they have these expectations, but they're not real with themselves. They're not real with others. You know, there's a, there, and honestly, let me say this, there's a bevy of things that yeah, of course. are wrong with why there aren't healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. So I can just name a few mm -hmm. <laughs> for some time mm -hmm. sake. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of the biggest things is that people don't want to be real. You know, whether it's people who send, as I say, their representative and, uh, you know, when they're first meeting somebody, when they're first interested in somebody, there's potential there. And, you know, they can fake for years. I mean, mm -hmm. I've known people who fake for years. I mean, my ex-wife honestly faked for several years. And that's why I tell people, you know, cohabitation don't mean nothing. I, I lived together two years with her and she just totally flipped it with somebody else. Because as I say in the book and I say that and I say that in the book. You know, people change, seasons change, environments change. So, mm -hmm. you know, in that, there's no, nothing is solidified. Anything mm -hmm. can change, right? Uh, but I think, you know, one thing is, is people being real. And so with that, I think it's also, uh, one thing that I always say is, uh, and I say in the book, self-accountability is a lost art. You know, people want to, like you said, blame everybody else. They never want to look at themselves. They never want to uh, be introspective. And I think that's one of the biggest things is to say that this book, I could, you know, all the stuff I went through, to be honest, I could write a whole book about all the stuff that my ex-wife put me through. But that, you know, how effective is that? 
because marriage, as I say, it takes two. Mm -hmm. So I had to be introspective, and 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 before even before writing this book, even before before thinking about it, I was introspective about what was my part in this failed marriage. So it, like I said, it takes two. But I think introspective introspection is the biggest thing because so many people can blame each other. I mean, in politics, we see it everywhere. You know, in the workplace, everywhere, everybody's blaming or wants to point somebody else's point the finger to somebody else instead of people coming together and having solutions mm -hmm. um, and creating solutions and, and, and doing those solutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world's crazy. People are going through so much stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are dying. There's pandemics taking folks out left and right. And there's still people who just don't want to be accountable for mm -hmm. themselves, even their own lives, their own success, their own careers, whatever. They don't want to do that. So I think that's those are two of the biggest things is, is really, you know, the reflection and the introspection on oneself, but really just being real and say, OK, what are the things that I expect out of somebody? Yes. But also, you know, can people get those things out of me if we're going mm -hmm. to be in a relationship? Yeah. 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 And I think that you hit that head on. I think and I, and I've been in a relationship for 18 going on 19 years now. And and I would like to say that, like, when me and her first got together, being a young man, urban community, didn't have a father. You know the story. A lot of yeah. things I didn't know. And this was really in. I was faced with hard moments that showed me who I am, because really, I tell people all the time relationship. One of the first things it does to you when you love the person, when you're invested to any degree, right? Mm -hmm. It shows you a mirror. If you respect them and you respect their opinion and, and, and what they're saying, they're going to show you a mirror. And can you deal with that mirror? Because that mirror, your parents have been telling you about that mirror and some of your friends have, but it ain't nothing like when a woman, <laughs> it, it, ain't, it ain't nothing like when a woman tell you what you're not doing or how yeah. you're not making her feel. And right. if you love her and want to, you have to kind of deal with that. You know what I mean? But I had to learn years later after going through so many things in my relationship that, okay, when I entered into this, I had no, who, I had no idea who I was as a man. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I wanted from a woman. This right. is actually extremely important. Like you people write down goals and people have a, 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 a vision board and all this. Yeah. You need to have a goddamn relationship board yes, where you this is what I'm not going to compromise on. This is what's kind of flimsy. You have to kind of go through this because you can end up putting yourself through something that was horrible and you could have been the cause of it you could have allowed mm -hmm. it to come in i like to tell mm -hmm. men too that we kind of lead the relationship you know what i mean we kind of are we're kind of the architects of the direction that it yeah. can go in so we kind of yeah. control those things so you're definitely right about that now i got another question for you yes sir because you've been divorced mm -hmm. and we have a conversation in our society now about should i even get married it or or do the benefits of marriage outweigh the realistic nature of the amount of people who are actually divorced or divorced or separated? So in 2021, like, what's your overall opinion of marriage? You know, it's so funny. <laughs> For 12 years, and I write this in the book, I just literally put this in the book as I'm working on the edits. After 12 years of swearing that I would never get married again, I'm getting married next year. I'm proposing to her next year. That's my plan. Okay. Uh, to the to the woman I'm dating now. Uh huh. Um, you know it it it's crazy, man. This this dating thing is crazy anyway. Mm -hmm. the, the dating scene is crazy because I say it's successful at this point. But the thing is, is that people to me have to they have to uh, as I say in the book, you know, they're looking for the perfect partner, but not the perfect partnership. The thing is, we're never gonna be perfect. None of us are perfect, but there's a perfect partnership if people want that. And so I think it's a thing about sacrifice and really wanting that and doing things like you said to evaluate, you know, what do I want? What do I expect? Putting expectations out there. That's that's the main thing about this book is talking about expectations, um, because this book is not just for it's about marriage. But as I say in the preface, it's not it's for anybody on any level, whether they're divorced, whether they are married, they're in a tumultuous marriage, whether they're uh, thinking about marriage, single, whatever, it's for everybody. And I think the biggest thing is for people, like I said again, I uh, said before, that introspection, right? For them to look and say, okay, do I want to do this or or not? And if I do, what are the things that I'm going to do to make this happen, but to make it a healthy partnership? Hmm. I mean, there's, you know, the statistics, and I, I literally just uh, finished that this week as well, 
is statistics for this year for divorce already, and it's only September, you know, the year hadn't finished, are alarming. Uh, first time marriages, 50% uh, in some studies uh, of divorce, uh, of marriages are divorced for first time uh, couples. Uh, people who, where one person at least has been married before, 60%. And then 73% for people who have been married, or at least one of the uh, people in the marriage have been married for a third time. Mm. Uh, and so, I mean, that's the thing. Divorce rate is crazy. But I think people have to, like I said, be introspective and want that healthiness in a relationship and that matriculates to marriage so that, you know, they thwart those statistics. They avoid those statistics. Uh, one of my uh, chapters is friendship. It's one of the biggest things. People mm. are so, you know, trying to rush into marriage. That's what they want. Um, and I don't want to sound chauvinistic, but women, when men, I tell a lot of my female friends, men don't think about relationships really. We don't think about, we never grew up wanting marriage. That wasn't the thing for us. And you know, I, I joke, the weddings are usually for women. That's what they love. They Very want all true, the big brother. stuff. I talk about that in my book. You know, when I got it's married, true. of course I was 22, too young to get married, too dumb mm -hmm. and whatever, got trapped, but I did. It. But mm -hmm. I realized, you know, in, in, in introspection uh, or retrospectively that you know, being too young wasn't an excuse because I still made that step. But the thing is, is that I did it all wrong. We weren't friends. Um, you know, I did it out of compassion for her because of things she had been through in her childhood. And I mentioned that in there. But the thing is, is, you know, that's one of the biggest things I've realized. I just helped a boy who just solidified his divorce. Um, I knew the, the wife first and I was in there with and I thought they were cool. They were best friends. And they realized in the end or he realized they weren't even friends. And so I think that's one of the biggest things is people taking the time to get to know each other. I tell people, you don't yeah, even have to, sure. even if you pursue somebody, do it where you're friendly, where you're enjoying each other when you're going out. Mm -hmm. Because I said, eventually you're going to be feeling like things are obligatory. Oh, I got to, you know, do get her a gift because it's an anniversary. Oh, I got to. Mm -hmm. No, you want to do it to enjoy each other. Um, yeah. That's one of the biggest things. My girlfriend now, man, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, like I said, you know, we, we actually went ring shopping. We were out in Cali a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that's the main thing we went out there for. And so, you know, with her, everything has been perfect. I went, we went to college together 20 years ago. I was in love with her, but I was too scared to speak to her, too scared to say anything. And so um, she ended up shooting her shot at me and I flew her in after that and everything's been perfect. We've been flying each other in because she's out of town for now, mm -hmm. uh, lives out of town. So the thing is that that's the biggest thing. You know, we're both divorced, but we realize the friendship is the most important thing. I uh, talk yeah. about that in the book, but I talk about being best friends, mm -hmm. not just friends, because anybody can become a friend, but mm -hmm. a best friend, it takes time, it takes care, and it takes a, a development of that best friendship. Mm -hmm. And so that's the biggest thing for me is for uh, for people to realize that they need to take the time to, to enjoy each other and to, to develop that. Uh, you know, I talk about, uh, you know, slow cooking food versus microwave food, you mm -hmm. know? Does mm -hmm. a person want that microwave food if they want a big, mm -hmm. juicy, succulent steak from a steakhouse? Are they going to go get that, you know, fast food frozen burger? Mm -hmm. or are they going to take the time and go a little bit further and get that steak that they really want? Yep. So, I mean, that's the thing, man. It's, 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 you know, marriage is great. But I think the thing is, is that people have to do more focus. And that's why I'm writing this book is so that people can have more of a focus on the things that they need. Foundation is the first chapter. You know, yeah. I, I use the analogy of a uh, of a house and how things in the house, the house may look beautiful, but if a foundation shaky and vulnerable, mm -hmm. then everything in that house is susceptible to detriment. Yep. So that's the biggest thing mm -hmm. is, are people going to work and take the time to lay that foundation? I talk about how that foundation just can't be laid and a house thrown on it. That mm -hmm. foundation's got to be laid. It's got to be laid right. It's got to be measured. It's got There's got to be a vision there. It's got to be executed. So mm -hmm. are people going to do that or are they just going to be throwing up something? And then just expecting it to, oh, well, if something happens, let's try to patch it up. But still, everything's still susceptible to, to a detriment or destruction. Yes. And I think the friendship piece, because, again, I've been with the same woman for 19 years. And yes. that's my trump card is the friendship because things waver. The Man. sexual desire, so to speak, changes over time to a degree. Yep. Um, careers change. Positions in life change. In order to deal with all this stuff, you got to be the person's friend. You know what I mean? Because yeah. people, if you, if people, <laughs> people change. Everybody change in subtle ways. Communication is a big thing too, which I struggle with at times. Communication is a big thing. And I also think, brother, 
that the societal norms surrounding marriage is a large part of why people get married. I think initially people should remove the idea of marriage and kind of just focus on because I'm not I'm not pro marriage as much as I'm pro healthy relationship. Yes, sir. Only because I've seen so many people get married. Yes, sir. And I see they're not friends. I see that they sometimes don't like each other. It's been like nine months and they're already complaining about things that if you complain about that now in seven yeah. years, because really it should be, let's look long-term. Let's mm -hmm. try our best to look long-term, but let's sure. spend the initial periods of our relationship literally getting to know each other. Yes, you sir. move in too quick, you can't get to know somebody. If you let them you introduce them to your kids too quick, you can't get to, well, you can't get to know somebody. You have to back up and say and be in a mindset of okay, I actually want to make this last. Yep. That's why I'm gonna go as slow as possible. Because think about it, if we're gonna be together forever, what's the rush? <laughs> That's it. You know what's so funny? You know, I, I I'll use two examples. Me, me and her only, have only been dating officially for about six months. But after uh, and you know, I think what's advantageous is that we've known each other all this go. time, right? There you go. So we've been friends. Um, we're both Greeks. So we were in the same Greek circles at, in college. We lived in the same dorm, all of that. So I've known her. And then, like I said, I had, you know, I, I don't even like to use the word crush. I think it's childish or effeminate. I, I hate that word. So for <laughs> me, I told her I had an affinity for her I, when, when I saw her. I mean, she was the, one of the baddest women on campus. All, all my bros, everybody, when she passed by, she caught everybody's attention without even trying. And I told her I had an affinity for you. And I said, it wasn't just a, it wasn't a crush. It wasn't, oh, I like her. It was a feeling. It was an emotion that every time you walk past me, I told her I, that emotion, it left. So for me, mm. I was like, that's one thing, but where's the friendship? How, how do we develop as friends? I talk about in the book how so many people, divorce is, is the thing that's thrown out in marriage so quickly. And I say, and I, and I say in the book, people do that because they're not friends, right? So when things happen, those times, like you said, happen, things happen or, or stuff changes, people change, they're enemies. They reveal themselves to each other as enemies immediately and say, I'm done. So I'm like, with the best friendship, no, you want people want to repair their, those friendships. Those, there's something there that there's a development there that happened. There's, there's that time, like you said, that's taken. So mm -hmm. that's the whole thing with her and I. We're like, we want to do this the right way. We want to do it because, of course, we've both been divorced or been married and divorced, right? Hated mm -hmm. our marriages, to be honest. So that's the thing is, OK, how can we do this? So now when we, when we you know, L.A., wherever we just went to L.A., went uh, you know, to my brother's wedding in Virginia a couple weeks ago before that. And we enjoy each other, dancing, having fun. I brought her to the I mean, even when she's here, you know, we go to the, uh, the uh, music museum here. They got a National African-American Music Museum that's been over about a year. Hmm. Man, we in there listening, le learning history, doing stuff, but we're still having fun, you know, kind of acting silly. Our conversations are so cool. So. That friendship is so important. It's just, it's the biggest thing that I, as I say in the book, people skip over. They don't mm -hmm. do the foundation. They don't do the friendship. It's immediately like you said, oh, let's move in. Let's go on and do this. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if it works. But yeah. I would say, or venture to say, majority of people, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something more there than, like you said, the things that fade. So mm -hmm. friendship now, man, is just, just such a big, big, uh, important, uh, vital aspect to me at this point. Definitely. Now, now something else, Dante, what do you think? Yeah. As far as some of the dysfunctions we display, black people, all people, like some of the dysfunctions we display in relationships, how much of this is you think um, what the relationships we've seen? Like I didn't have a father or I had a father who was abusive or I had a father who was there, but he wasn't there emotionally. He wasn't available. Do you think a lot of us, because like I was saying, we were talking about on my last show, a lot of us don't get therapy. A lot mm -hmm. of us don't don't see it keen to go talk to a non-biased party about our mm -hmm. circumstances. Since we don't do that, we're walking around with all this baggage. And you know what I mean? How much do you yeah. think that's affecting how we relate to each other? So crazy, man. You must have hacked my email with my book in it because I talk about that. I talk about therapy. That was something that in my marriage, I should have helped my ex-wife do. She went through mm. a lot of stuff in her childhood. And at the time, like I said, I was 22. So that's one of the things that I didn't know about, didn't understand, didn't didn't even think about. It wasn't a solution to me, but it could have. I think it could have helped. But I think the thing is, is it's on a case by case basis to me because there are so many people who have been through things, but they did what they need to do to, uh. to get out of it. 
So mm -hmm. I think the thing is, and I talk about how there's such a stigma, and I don't even mention black the black community, even though there is, I mention communities in general because everybody at, at some point probably could use therapy. Yes. And I yeah. think I, I think honestly, like I said, it's case by case because it's it's the, the willingness and the initiative of the person to go and get the therapy. But I also talk about how it's the partner's responsibility also to help them and support their partner or spouse in getting that therapy. So I think mm -hmm. it's the thing that there's got to be a willingness there. You can't help nobody who don't want to be helped. You know, all day long. Said about, you know, our grandmama said about crackheads. You can't help nobody who don't want to be helped. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like, are, are both people in that partnership, that marriage, that relationship, are they going to do what it takes to to uh, to take that step? Mm -hmm. Therapy, man, is beautiful. I mean, I started going to therapy uh, about two years ago. Um, started having anxiety. Like I said, I've had all these deaths and it started kind of hit me, mm -hmm. man, one day I'm going to leave my children. And I panicked. I was hysterical. Never had a panic attack before. It was just, it was crazy. But I had decided, okay, what can I do? And before me, go to therapy. And so for me, you know, that was something that helped me. Now, therapy may not help everybody, but mm -hmm. I think people have to take the initiative to find what works for them, whether it's therapy, whether it's, you know, I mean, even for me, I love, like I said, I love racing. I love um, my, you know, race, race on my motorcycle and stuff. I'm a, I love skydiving. I'm a thrill seeker. I love crazy, wild stuff. Those things help me, you know, with my anxiety, help me with stress, whatever's going on. If I get out and do something, I'm cool. If I'm going, if I'm racing on my motorcycle at 170 miles an hour, I'm not even thinking about nothing else because I'm thinking about, I got to stay alive. Mm -hmm. So it helps me to kind of just, just all that to dissipate and just be me, be, be mm -hmm. one, have peace. So, you know, whether it's therapy or something else, people have to take that initiative to, to, to step out make those changes, you know, I mean, that's, that's the whole biggest thing. That's the, that's another part of that introspection. People don't want to do that. They don't want to face that. Like you said, they a lot of times they want to face the mirror, but mm. if people are real with themselves, they face that mirror and say, okay, there's some changes that got to be made or else things are, are, are about to go downhill. Let me do it. Let me, let me do it. Yeah, yeah. It's just the initiative because it's putting in the work. I think it's too, just to be honest, it's too easy to get married. And sometimes too easy to get divorced. Like the, the process is very simple. And unless there's a very strong connection between the two individuals, mm -hmm. it's just a ceremony and it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> what yeah. you, you actually turn it into, because there's people of different religious factions. There's sure. people like myself who didn't choose to go through the traditional marriage because of certain yeah. reasons, right? But the yeah. bottom line is, Dante, what I've learned, the biggest thing, bro, long as you and that person is on the same page, because the outside, we're always tell my girl, it's us against everybody outside of this house. Now, that can be your parents. That can be your closest friends because they really don't know what's going on in your house. You can tell them what's going on and what happened to you and what she said to you and all this different shit, but they don't really get it. You got to yes, be sir. in that house to get it. At the end of the day, you're building a legacy with your family, with your girl. Y'all got to be on the same team. And yeah. then you go outside. And again, you face everybody, family alike. Yes, you know what I mean? And it's not an easy thing because yeah. a lot of us got family members. And it's about how influ because it depends on how you think as a person. But how influential is your family? Sometimes Man. women are getting married because... The auntie and the mom is saying, okay, girl, you've been with them two years now. Ain't it about that time? That is a completely horrible conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I talk about, you know, man, I'm telling you, we haven't, I'm just saying for the record, we haven't even talked about the book. And you, everything you're saying is in my book. I swear. I swear. That's crazy. I mean, hey, this, this is what it's all about. See, so yeah. introspection, man. You just, hey. But I talk about that. That's uh, my chapter called Freedom. Um, and I talk about, having freedom in marriage. And one of the biggest things I talk about is that outside, that external influence. I've seen it way too many times. I experienced it. Um, I'll be candid because I'm candid anyway. Most of my ex-in-laws, I cannot stand. Mm. Now, I, I was respectful, but I'll say this, that, that family has a whole, that's a dysfunctional family. And I don't usually call people dysfunctional or families dysfunctional, but I believe families are dysfunctional when they're not helping each other, right? Mm. They're causing rifts, they're causing mess, all of that, like you said, old folk, whoever, people who are bitter, old folk who are bitter, still whatever, right? As opposed to, and I, I, I juxtapose it to my family where, you know, I had an uncle, for instance, who was on uh, uh, cocaine and alcohol and all that, couldn't get clean here. And I still remember this. 
my mother has a, a, a something for him every year, or at least before the pandemic, to celebrate him being like 25 years clean, right? And so I told him the last time, I said, I know you don't remember this, but I was about five. Me, my little brother, my, and my cousin were in the back of my, my other uncle's car as my uncle had driven him from here to Atlanta to get clean mm. because he couldn't get clean here. I said, we help each other. And so that's the thing is, it, when it comes to those external influences, even friends, because I've seen it, and I, and I, I say this, and some, some women hate this, but it's the truth. Too many Pamela Jameses giving Gina Waters advice. And it's like, you ain't got no man. You're not married. You've never been married. It can't even get a text back. But you telling this woman all this stuff, oh, leave your husband. on. Like you said, you don't never know. I used to tell people, even when I was going through stuff, you never know what's going on in that pretty red, behind the pretty red door on, that, on the front of that beautiful house. Yeah. So the external, the external forces, man, is such a big thing. And that's one of the biggest portions of that freedom chapter. Uh, you know, I talk about other things, but that's one of the biggest things that I wrote about is making sure that this is a special, unique bond between you two people who are married, not mama, not uncle, not whatever. Uh, my girlfriend and I are talking about a friend who, you know, that's that's a problem with her, right? Her 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 in laws, and they're they're whatever. I said a couple other women I know who are married. They dealing with in law stuff. You know, one one girl she said her the husband, and I actually mentioned her in the book. But I talk I, with that freedom. It's in the freedom chapter, and I talk about the suppression and how the spouses spousal suppression really is what what I call it, where they're not th this person is not able to do what they want to do because of whatever, either because of the spouse suppressing them or the in-laws. And so mm -hmm. for me, that's a big thing, man, is that bond and keeping those things here and saying, okay, this is what we need to do. Now, as, as I say in the book, it's okay to talk to friends sometimes. It's okay to get mm -hmm. some advice. But when there's some serious issues going on, I'm like, there's too much bias most of the time for you to be talking to whoever. So at this point, that's where the professional help, like we said about therapy, you know, the professional yeah. help comes in, or somebody who's impartial, you know, with that impartiality to say, hey, you know, you were wrong or you were wrong. And then that introspection to say, or that admittance and accountability to say, okay, I was, okay, this is what I need to do to correct my actions. You know what it's, I mean? And, 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 thing's big, man. and it's so funny why, why you were saying that Dante, I was going over in my mind, just how society kind of rears us a little bit. I was going over in my mind, all of the movies and TV shows, where it was commonplace for the in-laws, the for somebody getting in your damn business. When you think about it, right? Like put yeah. everything you know to the side. It's actually <laughs> nobody's business what's going on in your relationship. Like you can tell who your mama. You can be like, you know, I, I appreciate it, but kind of mind your business. I mean, your yeah. your advice. How can you give advice, really? Now there are people who know how to be objective. And you'll you'll know those people you can go to when you're right. having a relationship. But most people I'm learning, even the people that love me, they're mm -hmm. going to have an unbiased way of thinking about it because they love me. Mm -hmm. So whatever I say, they're going to be on my side. That's yeah. not really going to help me. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? If I'm not really looking for some type of assistance, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like you or, said, or if you're in the wrong and, you know, and, and she's the one that's suffering. And they're saying, oh, well, but he's still right. No, like, really? I mean, there have been I mean, and, you know, this is extreme, but I've seen cases where the man or the woman or whoever is abusive mm -hmm. and their family members and relatives are enabling it or saying, well, you know, oh, well, that's just the way they are. I mean, I got a boy who um, I grew up with comes from a great family. You know, they, they actually, we grew up next door to each other, but we're in-laws. It's so funny. A couple of our relatives that got married, hmm. but this guy, you know, he's dating or was, well, I don't know, all off and on. It's crazy. But the, the guys, his baby mama, right? Basically. You know, they've been off and on for years, but I found out she had come from um, abusive, really uh, abusive family. Her father used to beat her mother like senseless. And suddenly she's doing that to him. Now, this guy ain't never put his hands on a woman, would never hurt a woman, nothing. But and he's a big guy, played football, all of that. You know, I mean, big as you know, he's like LeGarrette Blunt. Mm. And he comes, you know, over my mother's house one day, got bandages on. This girl had sliced him up over something stupid like pizza toppings that he got wrong in front of their kids. Damn. And, you know, they're going back and forth. And then he lets her move in. I mean, he, yeah, he let her move in. And she's, a matter of fact, it's funny. We grew up next door to each other. Well, where I live now, he moved in next door or down the street. So I'm pulling up and she's slamming her car and putting stuff in the car, cussing and carrying on outside. She was getting abusive again after he let her move back in with him because she was getting evicted from her place. 
So my thing is, he's talking to the mother, and the mother's like, "Well, you know, she can't." No, this girl needs help. But it's like you don't even want to—you don't even want to admit that because of what you had been through as a mother. But still, it's like you could stop it and stop this cycle. You know, even with my ex-wife, there were some things, some cycles, some cyclical things that happened, and I was like, "It's got to stop here." But without that, that, that impartiality, without that objectivity, as you said, I mean, it's for naught at that point, and anything can happen. I mean, this guy's life could be on the line, really, you know, because of that. So. And it's so, man, it's so funny you say that. You know, I've seen this video, Dante, about a year, two years ago, right? In the video, it was an experiment to show the difference between violence between men and women, right? So the first video, uh, they're in park, like a Central Park type setting. And a man is beating his girlfriend. They're actors. He's hitting her. Everybody in the park either says something, calls the cops, or they come to her aid, like, what are you doing? Blah, 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 right? It, it, it's like ants, they just swarm. Yeah. Same couple, next day, she's hitting him, slapping him, punching him, grabbing him, jumping on his back. Dante, everybody's laughing. They're laughing. Some dudes are looking at him sneakering, like, <laughs> what do you let their girl? See, see? So men, women hit men. We need to be clear. There are there are some abusive women and men get put into a conundrum especially if you a black man because if you then strike her or you do something the cop basically if the cops come you don't know what's gonna happen yeah it can't be fair where they say hey you got marks on you you got marks on you you guys right. go to jail but it's you're playing Russian roulette you have no idea yeah. and yep. we're prideful so what man unless you're really close to somebody what man want to say, man, you know, she over here hit me and my dog. She right. ain't, she over here hit me in my eye, dog. Right. We, we it, It's an uncomfortable conversation, it but women, women are abusive, too. So that's extremely yeah. interesting that you mentioned that. Yeah. Now, it's all it's to me, it's all about keeping people keeping their hands off each other, period. period. Because my thing is, at least for me, I've always said, OK, it's just like when, when I tell my children, if somebody puts their hands on you, you got every right at that point to defend yourself, whatever mm -hmm. way. So at that mm -hmm. point, I'm like, hey, keep your hands off. That's that to me. That's the thing. And even on social media, it's crazy. I, you, you'll see scenarios like that. And everybody's like, oh, well, what did he do to get hit? Oh, he, no. <laughs> That's not cool. What? Yeah, That's not crazy. cool. It's crazy. And I'm not I'm not the kind of man that wants to physically harm a woman. I know I'm exactly. stronger than most women. Right. It, it just doesn't sit right in my soul. But in, at any given moment, a man can be struck hard enough that his re his reactions will cause him to do something where he don't even know what happened. You know what I mean? Like there's a barbaric it's side human. to all it's of human. us. It's human. It's yeah. human, bro. It's human. So because I I've been in that situation where my uh, my ex wife had slapped me. I was sitting on the couch talking to somebody, and I was talking about. I said, "Yeah, I'm about to file for divorce, and you know she's going to get out and stuff." And she came across the house, punched me dead in my jaw. And I didn't touch her at all. I had she was still trying to chase me around and whatever and hit me. And I had grabbed her and put her on the ground. I said, You need to stop or whatever. And so she's the one that called the cops. Oh, he hit me. He did this. You know, and neither one of us ended up going to jail. I went to somebody else's house. And, but it was just a situation where anything, like you said, could have happened. Because I actually had left first and they told me to come back and you know, my friend's like, no, don't go back. I said, well, no, I need to go back because I didn't do anything wrong. But at the same time, who knows what, what could have happened? Mm -hmm. And then the time when, when when she did lie on me and I ended up in jail, it was also not just because of the, uh, she had said that I abducted the kids, but it was also because she had a domestic violence case against me saying that I was beating on her. And like I said, I hadn't been in Maryland in 20 years, mm -hmm. but they immediately believed, oh yeah, he did this. So I'm mm -hmm. suddenly a fugitive from the law, you know? No, no investigation. No, okay, you know, call me. What did what happened? None of that. It was just, oh, he's a fugitive. We got to take him in. And so, and yeah. sometimes as men, we're behind the eight ball because in a lot of different yeah. scenarios in society, it is extremely easy for women to get us in trouble. <laughs> it's very hard for us to get in. This could be with child support. This could be with the police. Just Anything. in how Man. women are viewed, and I understand it to a small degree. Women are not as strong as we are. But I think because of this, they learn how to be vicious yeah. <laughs> with their words yeah. and with their actions. Yeah. Cause if they can yeah. punch you and knock you out, they would. You know what I mean? You know it. You know it. Every time. 
Definitely, definitely. So thank you very much for coming on the show, brother. When you actually drop the book, we're gonna come back and talk about that too. But I want you to quickly because tell me tell me when the when uh, uh when the book comes out. Well, the book hopefully is gonna be out by the end of the month. Uh um, okay. just you know, still working on the edits and working with okay. my book coach to do that. But uh I'm gonna have a, a website up that's coming up and I'm gonna share that on my on my personal page. And I've got mm -hmm. a page, you know, a couple of social media pages out there. Also uh, got a website that's gonna go live. So it's going to be on the website and uh, hopefully by the end of this month we'll be done and and get it in out there because i'm let me try to do like you having a podcast and getting people on to talk about marriage and relationships i'm really just like i said trying to leave a legacy but i'm yeah, trying to know. help people to get healthy relation getting healthy relationships and marriages i mean that's the biggest thing i mean you know when i was on twitter i had like twenty thousand followers so you know people just read everything so it was funny then, the gender wars and all that. But now mm. I'm like, okay, it's getting on my damn nerves. At this point, <laughs> I got to help y'all. Y'all need to yeah. get these relationships to be happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done it, and anybody could do it. I mean, like I said, 12 years, I swore off not getting married. Um, and here I am about to get married or decide to get married. I got a line brother, too, getting married. He's divorced and met a girl at another line brother, our frat brother's wedding, uh, in February. And they just got, you know, what was that, eight, nine months ago. And uh, here they are engaged. Mm -hmm. Getting married next year, so it's possible, man. It's just people gotta do right, uh, you know, be friends and get out here and uh, do do what what it takes to uh, have um, those healthy partnerships. Definitely, man. And and, and yeah. again, I'm happy you you're using your experiences because again, you made a good point earlier when you said I could have wrote a book strictly talking about what this woman did to me, but in reality, not only will it be defaming her, and even though people do stuff to us, that's not necessary. What will we learn from that? So, no, you take it and be um, as as productive as you possibly can with the information. And we all are going through things that other people can learn from. Just everybody doesn't have the ability to situate their thoughts, whether it be on a show, whether it be on a piece of paper, whether it be on a T-shirt, wherever you want to put your thoughts. Everybody doesn't necessarily have the ability to share that in a way that can be beneficial to others. But if you look around this world, that's all this world is about, man. Sharing what you learn. People making a whole bunch of money every day. Just, just tell, hey, I did something. Want to know how? Right? That's that's yeah. what we're all just doing. We're learning and we're vessels for information. So I appreciate you coming on the show. Everybody, this is Dante Doss. He'll be dropping a new book at the end of this month or sometime very soon called We Need to Talk. Because in relationships, when we get mad, when things go real bad, it's a great title, by the way, brother. Because when we get mad, when things are going real bad, one of the biggest things we don't do is talk or we don't talk the correct way. So now we're yelling and screaming at each other and two adults can't really do that and be yeah. productive. So I appreciate the brother making a contribution to society, using what he's been through um, to 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 help the family out. This has been another episode of the Melanated Convo podcast family. Please do me a favor, like the video, share the video, become a subscriber to the Melanated Fathers TV YouTube channel. A lot of good stuff going over there. It's all about the rebuilding our families and our culture any way we see fit this is how i choose to do it dante's gonna write a book he's gonna get into the talking game too if you're into doing clothes if you're an artist if you're a psychologist if you're a college professor if you're a basketball coach you can affect change in a thousand different ways use what you see people doing to inspire you not to copy as much as to dig in dig into who you are and see what you can do what like dante is saying this that's the reason why i started all of this when i leave here my name is going to be synonymous with helping the community with helping black people and you're going to be able to see a track record of what i actually did we could have done like most people and work for 30 years retire 401k leave our family some real estate and some money there's nothing wrong with that but i want to leave a legacy that lives beyond me where my name is synonymous with a lot of things that are progressive and can help our people. So this has been another episode of the Melanated Convo podcast, man. I appreciate y'all tuning into the show. We out.